All right, welcome. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Freddy Sanchez, the Associate Director for the University Student Union here at Cal State Northridge. Thank you for joining us today as we host this joint program between the, the University Student Unions at both California State University Northridge and California State University Dominguez Hills. Today's program titled Palestine, History Repeating Itself, will foster a conversation about creating global solidarity, understanding social justice, and building allyship. As with any of our programs, we invite our guests to engage with, with the presenters through the chat. We will continue to learn from one another and understand that our experiences shape our understanding of the world we live in. We invite you to question, to validate, to embrace, and to learn how together we can continue to build community. Today is just a conversation starter. A program that is a half hour, an hour and a half minutes long cannot touch the surf, can only touch the surface of today's topic. We acknowledge that there's a lot to learn and invite our communities to come together for further discussion after this program, should there be additional conversations that must be had. We're here to support and embrace further dialogue. Before we get started, we recognize that California State University Northridge and California State University Dominguez Hills are on occupied land, and we would like to acknowledge our American Indian natives who came before us and are still here with us. I first welcome Dwayne Johnson, a student at CSUN, who will provide our CSUN land acknowledgement. Dwayne, welcome. Dwayne, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. California State University Northridge recognizes and acknowledges the Sessa Vitam, the first people of this ancestral and unceded territory of Sessa Venga that is now occupied by our institution. And it honors their elders, past and present, and the Sessa Vitam descendants who are citizens of the Fernandinho Tateviam Band of Mission Indians. We recognize the Sessa Vitam are still here and we are committed to uplifting their stories, culture, and community. Thank you, Duane. I now invite Anthony Thompson, a student at California State University, Dominguez Hills, who will share the land acknowledgement um, of Dominguez Hills. Thank you. We acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered here today is home and traditional land belonging to the Tongva nation. Today, we come with respect and gratitude for the Tongva people who still consider themselves the caretakers of this land. It is through their examples that we are reminded of our greater responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and take care of each other. I will now hand it over to Israel Sandoval. Hello, thank you, uh, Anthony. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Israel Sandoval. I'm the services manager for the local student union here at Cal State University, Dominican Hills. My uh, pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, very excited for us to uh, partner with CSUN and the USU uh, as a, a Matador alum. Um, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to be invited and be able to, to our um, moderator for today. And uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna introduce our, uh, today's moder uh, moderator, uh, Rana Sharif. Uh, Professor Rana Sharif is a researcher, educator, and longtime community organizer. She is currently a California State University Doctoral Incentive Fellow at CSUN, uh, where she teaches courses in the Department of Communication and Gender Studies. Uh, she is completing her doctoral work at the University of California, Riverside in Comparative Literature and Languages. Her research focuses on new and digital media possibilities for producing decolonial legitimacies for marginalized communities, putting into conversation Palestinian and Black liberatory subject subjectivities. She currently serves as the VP of the Union Board for the ACLU of Southern California and previously held an elected position with the City of Los Angeles' local neighborhood council. She's also a collective member of Swana Region Radio and hosting and producing shows for KPFK 90.7 FM. So welcome, Rana Sharif. Thank you so much, Israel, for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, hi, once again, I'm Rana Sharif. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And it's such a great honor to be your moderator this afternoon for today's program, Palestine, History Repeating Itself. We look forward to delving into today's topic and discussing social justice, global solidarity, 
and state sanctioned displacement of Palestinians and the relationship between what is going on in Palestine and among Palestinians and here in the United States. Unfortunately, there are far too many connections to be making. As we do so, it is our pleasure to welcome you to this joint program between CSU Northridge and CSU Dominguez Hills, which could not have been done without the support of Executive Director Deborah L. Hammond of USU CSUN, as well as Director of LSU at CSU Dominguez Hills, Cecilia Ortiz. So thank you so much for the invisible labor to everyone behind the scenes that's actually putting in effort to make this a possibility. Thank you. So before we get started, we have some logistical housekeeping items that I would like to bring to everyone's attention. Um, as you participate, as, um, as a participant in today's program, you have access to the chat function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and that is how we would like for you to um, interact with us. You can also submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. During the Q&A portion, which will come out towards the end of our program this afternoon, there will be an opportunity to ask the panelists your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you will again find um, closed captioning that may be used as needed. So again, welcome and thank you so much for being here. So at this moment, I would like to go ahead and introduce our amazing, brilliant and powerful panelists for this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to be introducing them in the order that they will be presenting. So first we have Dr. Keith Feldman. Dr. Keith Feldman is an Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. His research and teaching engage the intersection of critical ethnic studies, transnational American studies and Middle East studies. He's the author of over 20 scholarly publications, including A Shadow Over Palestine, The Field Life of Race in America, in 2015. Next, we have um, Natalia Monevasti. Natalia Monevasti is a Pan-African feminist poet, writer, and performer. She is the editor of We Are, a poetry anthology out of Penguin Press from 2008, and Wild in slash Imperfections, an anthology of luminous poems that's also out of Penguin. Um, 2021. Natalia is the author of Sarbo Dance and Elephant Woman's Song. Her academic writing um, is included in, among other journals and books, Scrutiny 2, Rhodes Journalism Review, Agenda Feminist Media, Utsiki, the National Political Science Review, and Sassinda Fouté Sisadafa, Black Feminist Approaches to Cultural Studies in South Africa's 25 Years Since 1994. Her poetry and jazz productions include the Out There Sessions, Poetry and Jazz at the Orbit, co-founded with Maisha Jenkins and Poetry Lives on um, unisaradio.ac.ca. Her experimental CD projects, Natalia Mobilaski and Soul Making, came out in 2015, and Come As You Are, Poems from Four Strings, that was out in 2013, are available for you on iTunes. She's an active participant within the organizations, Black Girl Brilliance and Africa for Palestine. Natalia has performed poetry and presented creative writing workshops in over 15 countries on five continents. She holds a master's degree in communica communication sciences from the University of South Africa and is currently completing her PhD in performance studies at Northwestern University. Welcome Natalia. And last but definitely not least, least we have Elizabeth Robinson, Elizabeth Robinson has been a community media activist, advocate, and producer for over 30 years at the local, national, and international levels, including her current program, No Alibis and Third World News Review, and her work with AMRAC, World Associ Association of Community Radio Broadcasts. As a journalist and Arab American, she has particularly attempted to provide corrective information about the Middle East for listeners and viewers. While the seeds of her political commitments might have been planted when she, she witnessed inequities at as a high school student, they, blast, they blossomed and matured as a matured, excuse me, as a consequence of her relationship to her life partner and the world he opened up to her. She occasionally writes, frequently broadcasts, and has mentored hundreds of broadcasters and is convinced that every voice is a radio voice. If our, um, let me go ahead and welcome you all. Thank you so much for being here. So we're going to go ahead, as I said, and. Um, have our presenters present in the order that I presented their bios. So again, we have Dr. Feldman, Natalia, and Elizabeth. Please keep your presentations as close to 10 minutes as possible, and we will have many other opportunities to engage. So I think we're gonna go ahead and begin with Dr. Feldman. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Sharif, and thank you all for coming. Um, thanks to all the organizers, Ayan, Samantha, Duane, all of the folks who are putting in the labor behind the scenes. 
Also, thanks so much uh, to my amazing co-panelists for the gifts of your fierce uh, wisdom and insight, and really to everyone in attendance um, for taking time out of your Thursday and to engage in this conversation. So <clears throat> as you know, the title for today's program is Palestine, History Repeating Itself. And in my brief remarks, I hope to sketch out what about that framing I find useful for thinking about solidarity and justice. And I also hope you'll allow me to prod at some of the limits of this framing before closing with a little lightning round of history. 10 minutes goes by really fast. So let's get underway. On one level, underscoring the ways history seems to repeat itself in Palestine tends to sharpen our attention to the ways images from Palestine continually recur, particularly uh, in US media. Over at least the last two decades, we can discern a kind of a persistent pattern in which representations of kinetic violence in Israel and Palestine erupt onto the American scene, drawing news coverage and social media play, drawing outrage. Sometimes Israeli military operations provide the proper nouns for these events. Operation Cast Lead, Operation Pillar of Cloud, Operation Protective Edge. Other events travel under broader names, often arising from Palestinian perspectives like the Al-Aqsa Intifada or Gaza's Great March of Return. While still others have yet to crystallize into a singular noun, such as the eruption last May during the holy month of Ramadan of protests against Palestinian displacement in Sheikh Jarrah, the cascade of Hamas rocket fire from Gaza, Israel's bombardment of the strip that followed, and the mass arrests and beatings of Palestinian citizens of Israel. Rarely are Palestinian voices heard in US media accounts, though more so in the last few years. And images of Palestinian suffering circulate across the media ecology, though rarely attached to a complex and thorough contextualization. Concerns over Israeli security routinely dominate the media framing. And we hear that Israel has a sovereign right to defend itself, whether it's from a spate of suicide bombings or from Hamas-led rocket fire more recently. The cycle of violence imagery is surely tragic, but the question of history, of how Palestine and Palestinians got to this moment routinely recedes into the background. We can grasp a different kind of repetition, albeit one whose effect of obscuring the study of history is the same when we pay attention to the ways critical discourse surrounding Israel and Palestine is sometimes characterized. And here I'm thinking of the repeated ways critiques of Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians or critiques of the ideas that drive and inform such policies become framed as de facto anti-Semitism, as hatred of Jews per se, even when no such Jewish, anti-Jewish animus is present in such critiques. One can trace this pattern at least as far back as the late 1960s, when a flourishing of critiques of Zionism following the June 1967 war was cast by some as the so-called new anti-Semitism, a stealth way of expressing animosity towards Jews as a class to court. The 1975 UN resolution condemning Zionism as a form of racism was greeted with accusations of anti-Semitism, particularly by US politicians, as was the outrage in the early 1980s against Israel's invasion of Lebanon. The 2001 debates about racism at the UN conference in Durban, South Africa, in the context of Israel's deepening occupation of Palestinian territories were likewise painted as anti-Semitic anti with the US representative walking out of the proceedings. And in recent years, statements against Israel's violent policies and practices 
are often speciously indexed as anti-Semitic. Now, anti-Jewish animus is real and it is profound, full stop. Anti-Semitism animated and found expression in some of the most vile acts of state-sanctioned violence and genocide in the 20th century. Today, its ideological content is often shared with anti-Black, anti-Muslim, and anti-immigrant fears. Recall Charlottesville 2017, Jews will not replace us. Recall one of the insurrectionists in the US Capitol in 2021, sporting a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt alongside the Confederate flag. Commitments to combating anti-Semitism must be part of commitments to fighting racism and white supremacy. At the same time, the repeated conflation of anti-Semitism with critiques of Zionism, that is of the ideas that inform policies and practices of a state, repeatedly precludes the possibility of advancing rigorous accounts of ideas and their origins, their practices, their effects. It precludes a thorough engagement with history, including of how Palestine and Palestinians got to this moment. So while I find the title of today's session to be really illuminating on one level, in that it invites us to think about patterns across time, I also want to throw a bit of a wrinkle into that framing kind of from the get-go, if you'll allow me. What I've tried to suggest in these examples is that focusing solely on the repetition of images or the repetition of discourses without attention to context can sometimes obscure a focus on the agential work of people marshalling evidence to tell stories about the past. To think historically is to think about context, is to think about people in places, people making sense of the worlds around them as conditions improve and deteriorate, as people attempt to shape those worlds given where they are and what they have, given the ways power and resources are distributed, given the stories they tell and share. So now it's the lightning round for some history. Rashid Khalidi, one of the foremost historians of Palestine, writing today, argues in his newest book, The Hundred Years War on Palestine, that such a history needs to be told as a history of settler colonialism and resistance. Now, Khalidi joins many scholars of Palestine in advancing and deepening this important claim. Khalidi shows in particular how desires for a Jewish national home in Palestine have since the end of the 19th century been understood as one way to build a safe haven from antisemitism. Such desires have also been paired with desires for the removal of the indigenous Palestinian presence from that land desires that is for Jewish national sovereignty expressed in part through the colonization of Palestinian lands and the dispossession of Palestinian people. Now techniques and rationales for colonization and dispossession have changed from the time of say the Balfour Declaration of 1917, when England declared its support for facilitating a Jewish national home in Palestine but the ideologies and their effects have often persisted. And importantly, such desires have never fully encompassed the various ways Jews have envisioned creating worlds of safety, worlds of flourishing for themselves and their neighbors. Likewise, Palestinian political desires contesting their removal have been active since at least the end of the 19th century. And the character of those desires has likewise changed over time. They've been refracted through local labor organizing. You could look back to the 1920s and 30s. Since 1948, they've been mediated by the geographical fragmentation of the Palestinian people, a diaspora of refugees that today is the longest standing and largest refugee population in the world. 
Palestinian political desires have been refracted through internationalist, anti-colonial, anti-apartheid movements, through state building and development projects, through human rights and humanitarian discourses, and through anti-racist and anti-war discourses, among others. Neither the repetition of politically motivated conflations nor cycle of violence imagery provide access to even this kind of lightning round of history. All of these stories and more are resonant in one way or another today. They're available to think about in the present, to study and learn from when we're given the space and the time and the resources to do so. That work, that work of study is part of grappling with critical questions of solidarity and justice. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Go ahead, Natalia. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much uh, to the organizing team of this very significant event. Um, my name is Natalia Molevazzi. And I was born and raised in Tembisa, one of the many townships in South Africa. I, I would like to address you today on three aspects and will be as concise and as brief as possible. Two of which are some of my reasons or commitments to standing with the people of Palestine and the third and last aspect would be some suggestions on how to support um, solidarity with the people of Palestine. Um, I was just talking about the township in the definition uh, or the context of South Africa. You can say it's a ghetto. And these are some of the most barren lands that were reserved for black people by the apartheid government, which is a project that started officially in 1948, the same year that um, the state of Israel was officially established. Um, for the 80% of the majority of people being in uh, scrammed in, in these lands, um, was also a project that was modeled in some way by the apartheid government on um, the Native American reservations. Um, and my mother grew up in these, in these spaces. Um, and I was born also and raised in these spaces. The kind of trauma of the forced removals um, massified in the mid 50s and was full swing in the 60s. My mother born in 1960 on her grandparents farm um, in an area called Ferndale in Randburg, South Africa, which is today one of the most prime um, establishments um, but it when she was six months old they were removed from that land and in 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 efforts to erase some of these memories her birth was registered as having been born in alexandra south africa's most populous and smallest township um, this apartheid project and forced removals was a very well researched in a sense that everything that represents the township was, and unfortunately is still less, the education of our children, the healthcare, rec recreational facilities to name a few. My mother still lives in the township and until recently had no desire, um, no economic means to move out of the township. And as you can imagine, even 
after offic uh, um, apartheid officially ended in 1994. The work of apartheid, well-funded, um, well thought through, well structured, its legacies remain in place. And so the many, most, or rather the majority of the people of South Africa, the black people still live in townships and in shanty towns, unless of course, a very few people such as myself who, and I'll say a very few in relation to the 80% of the black population in this country, very few people like me who can speak English, who have university degrees, who travel, who, who take um, long walks in the suburbs of, of, of Westcliff and Melville, whose children go to private schools, um, they often create a bubble for themselves that sometimes makes them avoid or forget the harshness of the lives of our country. Um, I am mentioning this, this scenario because you might wonder how did apartheid last so long and how these legacies remain so deeply entrenched in our society? It is because South African apartheid was, or rather is a global project, one that was armed by many governments, including the Israeli governments, one that was protected by Britain, by the US, by Europe, and continued to subjugate people. And in this way, the end of it seemed such a big and impossible project. But those who fought and sacrificed many with their lives did not stop um, this fight. And they were also supported uh, by those who gave us a fighting chance, such as uh, 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 Cuba, um, the civil rights movement right here in, in, in the US and the entire continent of Africa in many ways um, was behind the people of South Africa and even offered ref refuge to those forced into exile. As much as apartheid survived because of the global interest of, in its profits, you know, much like the profit of slavery or human trafficking today, apartheid also ended, at least officially, because of a progressive global effort, albeit in pockets of, of, of global society. Um, it, it, it happened because of those global efforts. Like how Nelson Mandela said to the late Yasser Arafat that South Africans will never be free until Palestinian people are free. And that's just one of the connections. The second reason pertains to my visit in, to Palestine in 2013. Um, I was invited as, as part of a, of a cultural delegation um, and I had been writing poetry about and for the people of Palestine. But when I visited Palestine, there were some things that could not be understood through writing or through explanation, but only through experience. And so the experiences such as the interrogations and sometimes detentions that happen, that happen at the airport in Ben Gurion, uh, the lies that people have to tell in order to be allowed into the country. Um, me driving in, in the bus on a beautiful freeway juxtaposed to the slums of Palestine, but also the hope in the eyes of the people I met um, seeing Palestinians crammed at checkpoints um, and the restrictions to their movement while I, as a tourist, just drive, drove past on a nice freeway. 
um, sometimes also being searched um, as artists, um, Israeli soldiers, or I should say child soldiers, because they looked like 17 and 18 year olds as they searched musicians. This was also an experience that I felt in my bones as something so similar to what was, uh, was happening in, in, in South Africa, only like volume turned up a hundred times. Um, so, so this was also another connection um, that, that, I, that was not just individual, but political. It was, it was a collective um, experience. And so these solidarity efforts with Palestine thus can never be isolated. And, and Palestine cannot just be viewed as a single experience. It is connected to the isolation we all experience for wanting to be free. Uh, all kinds of freedoms we seek for ourselves and those we love are intricately connected to others in more ways than we can imagine. Um, you know, the fact that the US continues to support the war that keeps Palestinian people in an open air prison is, con you know, is connected to the prison industrial com complex in, in the US and, and other countries, South Africa, Brazil. It is people who, who look like me mostly. Um, and, and, and it is because of the project of capitalism that silences um, those who fight for freedom and, and, and those who disrupt the hungry machinery of capitalism are punished. Um, and so these systems, all of them, sexism, homophobia, tough immigration laws, corruption, poor education, they are a threat to the project of capitalism and, and therefore the manufacture of fear and landlessness are how those in power stay in power. Um, in this way, the, the, the Native American land that you are standing or sitting on right now or how Mexico um, and Australia were taken and how the annihilation of Palestinian people continues. These are the death dealing um, or the examples of the death dealing machinery of modern slavery. And it thrives on silence and the lack of organized resistance from everyday people like us. And this is why I stand with the Palestinian people because the experiences feel so similar. And I also refuse to be silent about the global evils that continue to ride the backs of native people everywhere. And briefly, lastly, I know I'm running out of time. I want to share just a few everyday actions that we can all show or do um, individually and collectively to support the Palestinian struggle which is our own struggle. Um, find out, especially now in the age of digital organizing, who is doing what, where in relation to solidarity movements. Um, and you don't have to be an expert of politics or history to identify violence and human suffering, not only in Palestine, but everywhere. Read. Find out the difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, for example, in order not to be intimidated by your stand and your support. Direct your anger and disapproval to the state of Israel and not to all Jewish people. Know too that you cannot be an ally if you do not critique capitalism and how it seeps into every aspect of our lives. Try where you can um, to not buy products that perpetuate the violence 
um, by the Israeli state, such as association with G4S companies. Um, when you are aware, if you are aware, dissociate yourself and do not keep silent about why. And if you're an artist, compose work that fights oppression. Learn the map, different countries and people and the histories of those people. Buy, at least try to buy and support local economies wherever you are. Support organizations like Africa for Palestine and many others. Buy a t-shirt or kefir from those organizations. Wear it and not just as branding, but as marking of yourself as a supporter and as an ally. Join protest matches where you are. Use social media, use your celebrity as a tool of support and resistance against the annihilation of Palestinian people and of people, native people everywhere. And finally, I know I've been saying finally for a long time. I'll take a minute to say, do not forget to call and enter exist in your emerging existence. Do not forget to merge and desist our penitentiary solidarity. Do not forget to remember our mother's struggles at the kitchens, Las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, Mothers of Bezlan, Kana, Shabra and Shatila Shatta, my rights into passages of shredded dreams and longing for homes yet to be known. But a luta continua. Our struggle goes on. So find at the depths of your days an opportunity to remember Hiroshima, Fallujah, Rwanda, Uipatom, Bopa, pain still blinked into that wounded me. Those scars were rubbed off the skin that delicately wraps our faces, leaving no traces of life. So do not forget to remember. And this one is for all the children of Palestine. I wish you happy. I wish you whole as words water a flower beneath the yellow rays of yearning. Beyond the reach of growling pains, I wish you inviolable dreams flourishing under the silent yet attentive gaze of the moon. I wish you a sky open enough and ready for thoughts of light. Simply simple earthly delights pouring in and out of this moment. I wish you alive, child of Janin, child of Ramallah, child of Gaza, playing a game of cards in the blossoming pathway of unfolded wings. Here, a wish for you of brave dreamlings touching your eyes at dawn, picking shells along the beach with your brother on the roof of your home, feeding doves, fitting your wedding gown someday, marveling at the beat of your sister's heart, laughing at your father's funny stories, happy, harvesting olives and memories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Holly, for that. Um, um, Elizabeth, go ahead, please. Um, it's hard to know where to go, but I'm going to try and do some brief things, both of which uh, are entirely in sync with um, my other panelists, and I'm pretty sure with Rana Sharif as well. Um, she and I share a radio uh, link, sort of. Um, 
what I want to say is all about the media in some ways, and I can't do it as eloquently as Natalia has certainly, or as concisely as Keith has. But I want to give you some places to go because in 10 minutes, you can't do much more than that. And to say uh, um, above all that you have to remember who is telling the story and ask that always, who gets to tell the tale? And I'm going to do a brief one from my young adulthood growing up in the US and part in the South and part in an Arab American community in which uh, probably most of the women put pink powder on their faces so as to look like they fit in better in uh, this Southern Baptist community that they found themselves in. Um, so there was a kind of self-denial always going on. And it was in part because we didn't know or they didn't know their own history or the place where they sat. So a couple of things I can tell you is that there's a town in Texas called Paris uh, and it has a history of one of the very bloodiest lynchings ever in this country in the early part of the 20th century. And it was directed, of course, at Black people. But also in that town, there was an Arab community that was run out of town. Um, my parents met because my father's family had been run out of Paris, Texas, and he settled farther east in Texas. So there are all of those things that we can recount. But the tale that we were told almost always was very different. We were told the tale of Exodus, of Yuan, uh, Leon Uris's book entitled Exodus. And that was a very, it turned into a, a blockbuster movie with very heroic um, exp sort of ex uh, explication of the creation of Israel very much going to that what's now a trope that there were no people or very few people in this land and that it became a home for uh, European Jews fleeing um, Europe in the post-World War II area. So that's what I saw. I saw kibbutz. I saw um, uh, orange groves. Um, I saw stories about cities like Haifa, and it was a very long time before I understood that Haifa had another name, and that was Jaffa, and that was a name that was kind of familiar because there were oranges that came from that place. So Jaffa became Haifa, and what had been, I think there's a wonderful film, and I can't think of the name of it right now, perhaps, Rana, you know it, about uh, Jaffa or Haifa in the 1920s, which includes lots of imagery of Arab and Jewish workers together in that town, uh, not at each other's throats, you know, not uh, evidence of these people having been at each other's throats for centuries and you just can't fix it, which was the received wisdom for many people here. So um, if we look at any number of things, we find that uh, there are, uh, there's not only anecdotal um, uh, incidents, but very real ones that come to mind. The last piece that I wrote with my husband was about uh, Ferguson and the uh, killing of a black man there who you should be able to know. And we started a short article that was requested by an Italian uh, online magazine. And before we got through the first paragraph, we said two things. These are everyday events in the United States, and they still are. 
and their everyday events in Palestine. And people in Palestine and people in Ferguson understand those connections. Um, so we need to remember that policing is going on, that policing in my town, um, Santa Barbara area, um, the sheriff proudly proclaimed that he'd been trained by the Israeli police in Israel. And this is uh, something that happens a lot. So when you're thinking about who tells the tale, you have to wonder where it's coming from. So I'm getting, there's so much that's come across here that I can't uh, in some ways capture it, but I wanna just mention uh, a couple of things today. To the organizers, thank you for this. And to say that a land acknowledgement should take us right to the heart of Palestine. If we recognize that we live on occupied land, we have to understand that that is exactly what uh, Palestine is. And so if we know that, then we have to begin questioning a lot of things. Um, it's hard to do. Uh, the BDS movement in this country is really born out of the South Africa uh, or the boycotts of apartheid South Africa. And the models are there. And we need to say, is this, is this a, a case of telling this side and then this side? Or is it a case of saying there are some things that are just fundamentally reprehensible and we have to engage those around those. So I'm gonna refer you to a couple of things that you can look at as Natalia has suggested. And one of them is a very old book and I'm trying to check my time. I think I'm okay for another minute or two. Thank you. This is a book called The Birth of Israel, Myths and Realities. And it is by a man no longer alive called Simha Flapan. And he was a member of the Israeli uh, Knesset, their Congress. And 30 years after the creation of the state of Israel, there were files that were made public for the first time. And Flapan went to those files and wrote this book in which he debunked the most uh, frequent mythologies about the creation of the state of Israel, that the Zionists had accepted the uh, UN partition, that Arabs rejected uh, the partition and launched a war, that Palestinians fled voluntarily, and so on. So that's, that's kind of bedrock stuff. Uh, and it's hard to find, but you can find it in a university library, I think. Another thing that I think we have to do in terms of trying to understand who is telling the tale is to look at something like a book like uh, another old one again by Jack Shaheen entitled Real Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilify, Vilifies a People. And you can, in that, think about the, the images that you have seen in which, you know, uh, it might be an Arab, it might be some other swarthy character. Um, <laughs> exactly what swarthy means is in the eye of the beholder, I suppose. Uh, but there is a systematic um, demonizing of Arabs in our culture. And it's in part based on old stuff, pre Israeli. It's also in part based on what looks familiar to the Western eye. And I think if we think about that for a minute and we compare uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to Yasser Arafat for a moment, which one looks like the, the upstanding citizen who would appear on your television news program? Most likely it's uh, Bibi, his nickname. Netanyahu. He's Western educated, his English is unaccented, he's dressed in a suit and tie, and he certainly doesn't have a scruffy beard. 
all things which were uh, in, in the time of Yasser Arafat. He was the antithesis of all that. So we need to understand um, how we're manipulated without even thinking about being manipulated. Um, if you're looking for information, one of the things I'd, I want to make sure you know about for either of the campuses that we're talking about is there was re a recent Human Rights Watch report which uh, indicated or uh, was very blunt about, uh, I think the name of it was a threshold crossed Israeli authorities and the crime and the crimes of apartheid and persecution something that Human Rights Watch had avoided saying for a couple decades, I think, a long time in any case. But see the report for sure. But in the report, there are wonderful graphic images that tell a history by a group called Visualizing Palestine, which is really a subgroup of one entitled Visualizing Impact. They are in Montecito, California. I'm trying to get an interview with them. I'm trying to find them right now I mean, to talk with them, but their graphics are amazing. And I think when we're trying to tell a different tale, we do need those glosses that uh, people can go to without uh, having to sort of gather everything into one little tiny space. Um, of 10 minutes, and I probably am just about there. So um, I know I've got a whole bunch of things I was going to tell you. Uh, I was going to say something about Sabra and Shatila because people don't know about this horrendous instance that happened about 35 years, 38 years ago, maybe now, um, in which a massacre was carried out not necessarily directly by the Israelis, but with the Israelis surrounding two uh, refugee communities and uh, killing, we don't know how many. The conservative figure was 300 and something. Uh, the more realistic ones were 10 times that many. We have to try and make sense of this stuff and we can't if we're just saying, well, the Palestinians fired rockets and the Israelis fired rockets and the da 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 and this and that. And if we fall for an argument of equity, we're going down a horrid place. My final comment is that I am at a campus, UCSB, where the student body has uh, the the members of the their uh, senate rather than take up this issue of BDS, have uh, left meetings so that they wouldn't have a quorum, so they wouldn't be able to vote on it because they were, were afraid that the outcome would require BDS. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think we have to sort of take it head on. And thank you all for doing this. I've told several people that this was happening. They say, oh, at Berkeley? And I say, no, uh, you know, they'll name UCLA, some other place. They mostly won't name CSUN, although I think the, the work that's being done at these institutions is phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Once again, thank you to our speakers, Keith, Natalie, Natalia, excuse me, and Elizabeth. Um, I am just wanting to be mindful of the time. So we'll have about a 10 to 12 minute conversation um, based on, there's a lot. So I apologize in advance. We're not gonna to get to go through everything so that way we can open it up to our, part, um, our guests. So if you are um, a guest and you would like to submit a question, please go ahead and do so through the Q and A. So as soon as our shorter moderated session kind of concludes, we can go ahead and have you all uh, present your questions. I think we might have lost Elizabeth, so hopefully she'll come back. No, I'm oh, the, oh, there sorry. you are. Okay, wonderful. No, it's okay. I'm I'm reorienting in these uh, rectangles. Um, so there's, as I said, there's a lot to unpack. So what I'll do is perhaps um, ask. A, I have a couple of questions for each of you, and then we can kind of have a conversation together if that if that works. 
so I'll go ahead and start with uh, Keith. Um, I think one of the kind of glaring things that I actually was puzzled by in terms of moderating was the title my, myself. So um, I was thinking about, you know, you alluded to the kind of cyclical or circular and the kind of limitations of that. But one of the things that actually um, you mentioned actually was mentioned uh, by Natalia as well as Elizabeth, and please feel free, um, Natalia and Elizabeth, to also chime in, is the centering of Palestinian voices, right? So I think one of the concerns is that, you know, here's a panel that's on Palestine, Palestine and granted the context of this conversation is global solidarity. Um, but it is very difficult to center Palestinian voices with, even within these spaces as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that might have to do with visibility and the kind of fears associated with that. And um, namely around anti-Semitism, claims to anti-Semitism. So if actually this is a question that I'd like to pose to all of you, is that what are your thoughts about the ways in which folks that are doing critical work that are also Palestinian, uh, we have academics, scholars, practitioners, um, that also find being in such spaces and having, you know, being visible in many instances, and this was actually a conversation that I had with the organizers, could actually be very damaging, career-wise and otherwise. And I know that this mm -hmm. is something that, for example, um, tenures have been denied to faculty members, or, you know, there have been, um, there's a, many of you might know, the canary list that names and lists anyone that has done any kind of work on Palestine, and that might follow them in the professional spheres as undergraduate students. So if we can have a conversation about what does that mean, in fact, to center Palestinian voices. Another question um, is, and, and, this, and, and this kind of conflation around anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And then Natalia, thank you so much for ge generously sharing so intimately the experiences of your mother and yourself mm -hmm. and centering that in the work that you do, I think is extremely powerful because if it were not for our, our elders, my own mm -hmm. elders, my maternal and paternal grandmothers and my mother, I think that the stories would have been lost. So I wanted to mm -hmm. actually ask you to talk a little bit more about the possibilities, the liberatory and resistance possibilities of creative arts. You talked about your own poetry, you talked about artists, and why is that so central to the work on Palestine and South Africa? Um, because, and like, what is it about creative outlets that mm -hmm. allow for us to imagine new things, which actually links to the next point, Elizabeth, that you made, um, you mentioned Jack Shaheen's work, the late great Jack Shaheen, um, building on the work, of course, of postcolonial theorist Edward Said and Orientalism, mm -hmm. and the kind of tropes of Palestinians um, and Arabs and Muslims. And unfortunately, we find ourselves reproducing that in our contemporary Im imaginings. But one thing you actually noted was the creation and mythology of the state of Israel. So what's interesting is that creations and mythologies are useful in terms of a nation state. Mm -hmm. But in the context of Palestine, um, there is no nation state. So what does it mean to imagine and to talk about not center, once again, a Palestinian narrative? So I think that these are questions that actually all of you can um, uh, address. So I'd like to open it up and we'll have a small, a short conversation. We can move from there. We would like to start off, I guess. We can start with Keith, since I said, Keith, go ahead. Sure. Um, Ronald, such, such great questions. and. Natalia, Elizabeth, thank you so much for such, such rich presentations. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, say, I'll say two things um, to get at um, what we might think of as this kind of structural occlusion, or, you know, I, I use the word shadows in, in, in my own work, but the, the, the sort of the, the mm -hmm. occlusion of Palestinian voices, Palestinian histories, Palestinian documents. Um, the, there is a, a long and deep history of erasure, um, um, certainly in the Israeli context, is, is erasure of Palestinian archives, um, uh, Palestinian books, Palestinian universities we've seen in, in the last several decades and thinking about um, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in the, in the early 1980s, part of the um, Israeli strategy in the invasion of Beirut was to um, systematically grab hold of um, a Palestinian archives, a vast archive of Palestinian resources about 
pre-1948 Palestine, including okay. things like uh, land claims and um, mm -hmm. personal narratives, photographs and the like. So there's a, a kind of a systematic and structural occlusion of Palestine and, and Palestinian voices um, that we routinely need to um, struggle to contest, right? And I think at, at every turn, we need to contest that. Um, and it's, um, it's heartening to see um, in small ways, but I think in significant ways, um, space on uh, popular media, mainstream media, places like the New York Times or the Washington Post or CNN or BBC and the like, um, interviewing Palestinians, Palestinian um, scholars, activists, organizers, um, sometimes framed in this, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand debates, um, uh, and sometimes given full kind of more extensive space to, to do that kind of work. And maybe the, the last thing I'd say is that this kind of conflation of anti-Zionism or critiques of, of Israeli um, ideologies and practices with anti-Semitism is um, another practice of erasure, right? Mm -hmm. for, um, um, for Palestinians to tell stories of, um, of one's own experiences in the world and one's family's experiences in the world are de facto to challenge Zionist myths, Zionist ideologies. Um, and so things, you know, blacklists and, and other kinds of contemporary practices of censoring are doing precisely that kind of structural work to, um, to obscure um, Palestinian presence, Palestinian voices. And to the degree that we can um, name that practice as such and, and contest it, um, I think that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. part of the work. Thank you so much for that. Um, it, it did um, Natalia or Elizabeth, would you like to uh, respond or add to uh, Kate's comments? I just wanted to, to thank you. Thank you so much for that, Professor Feldman. I want to, to speak to the question of art as a, as a liberatory uh, strategy and, and also what does centering uh, Palestinian voices. For me, I, I don't want to say it's easy to center Palestinian voice to be to, to hold on to the conviction and the evidence. Um, it's because when you grow up in an apartheid state, you see it every day. You see the legacies of it every day. You, it is, it is the, the people's bodies and memories that are the theory. Um, you, you see a majority of people that even a five-year-old will ask you, why are people here poor? You know, my daughter would ask me every time we go visit my mother, but why do people here live in such close proximity? Why don't they have swimming pools? Why, why don't they have tennis courts? You, you understand that even a five-year-old can see that the same way that you see a freeway that is beautiful and open in, 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 the, side, in the Israeli side, and you see poverty. On, on the other side, you have to ask those questions. And, and it's not, it, 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 it moves from, from, from asking questions like, um, uh, is, is, is Israel or South Africa an apartheid state or not? Or are we, you move from, from, from that because when you see the machinery of, of capitalism and how it works to subjugate people, you start to see the, the, the real picture before you even go to reading books and, and, and theories. And when you see uh, people, and, and I mean, the South African case is recent. I, it, 
really in 1995 and 1996, I was an entire teenager. And, you know, we were still being chased with baseball bats in university campuses by, you know, civilian kids who have been brainwashed to believe that a black person cannot occupy the same space as, as them, you know? So, so it's, it's not even a question. Yes, we are living in, in space. In, in, yes, Israel is a state, is an, is an apartheid state. S same, similar to um, the, 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 the former uh, South African state. Um, and and the, the creativity as a strategy for liberation is some of, you know, the first, um, one of the first uh, speeches to be um, heard from in the UN, in the UN uh, uh, assembly was written by three artists um, presented by one of those artists called Miriam Magera. <laughs> and I'm sure most of you know. And the speech was written by a William Kiurapet Kosisile and a Jonas Guangwa, a jazz musician, a poet, and a singer. Mm -hmm. And the world opened their eyes and saw the things that were happening in South Africa. And another quick example, the, the, the world started to see this woman called Sarah Bachman, whose body was put in jars and, mm -hmm. you know, in front of the museums mm -hmm. and all that. The reason her body was brought home 200 years after she endured all that violation was because a woman called, Sarah, uh, uh, called Diana Ferris wrote a poem called, I've Come to Take You Home. That poem ended up in the French parliament and it pushed uh, uh, the government of France to bring this woman back. This is just a small example of what resistant, resistance art, protest poetry and music can do to conscientize people about oppression, about apartheid, about slavery. I'm gonna shut up. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. It really does humanize um, and center the subjectivities of Palestinians and other marginal communities in ways that allows folks to feel connected. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think that that's actually a perfect segue into the question for Elizabeth and this notion of um, creation and mythologies and how in one instance, uh, you have the erection of a nation state um, at the expense of, uh, you know, as a settler colonial nation state. And then, you know, why are those same mythologies not afforded to Palestinians and indigenous communities here and far? And really the kind of polemics around objectifying Muslim and Arab American bodies and particularly in this post 9-11 moment here in the United States that we're seeing this as well. So if you can go ahead and comment on that. Um, I will, I wanna say backtrack over uh, quickly to uh, Keith's notion of erasure and shadows, because I think so much of what we think we know is what's left after the erasures and the shadows have been cast. Um, and uh, that in turn says, uh, leads us to other mythologies, including that the nation state has always existed in most of the world. Well, it hasn't. <laughs> and I would argue right now, although I don't have time to do this, that it's coming apart at the seams in many, many places. We have really bad nation states not functioning well. So if we're looking to other spaces that include our histories and include uh, as well, I think, our cultures and the arts, uh, we find much richer ground than we might uh, if we're looking at the nation state. But I think uh, to, to more directly answer your question, Rana, to acknowledge a state means to acknowledge the right of Palestinians to exist. And the other part of your question, one of the things that I have found that really troubles me 
is that on most of the campuses I'm familiar with, we talk about Jews and Muslims. This has not been about religion. And uh, we need to be clear about that. Um, and Natalia, and uh, of course, has said something about capitalism. Can we say a dirty word about capitalism? Oh, yes, please. Um, because it's, it's functional uh, in those terms. Um, but uh, for me, if one begins to imagine a Palestinian state, then we have to imagine a Palestinian people going in that direction maybe than the other. And we have to understand that the things that have been created thus far, like Gaza, like the Palestinian Authority, are not state apparatus or apparati, whatever. Uh, they are rather policing functions that have been put in place to control a population, my argument in any case. So, um, but I, if we're trying to reduce this to religion, there's a reason for that, I think, because it's useful to say it's just a religious conflict. And I think if this is in another aside and I'll stop, I think that the, uh, that Lebanon was dangerous because it was a multi-confessional state um, doing what Israel was arguing at the same time was not possible. So I don't know if I answered no, thank your you question. So much. I mean, there are m many insights to bring in. And I, I just want to say that in terms of um, the protecting certain bodies, I mean, we're seeing this just right here at the U.S.-Mexico border with Haitian, excuse me, um, um, Haitian um, asylum seekers and the kind of ways in which certain bodies are amplified and seen as protectable and um, valued um, and other bodies are not. And I really do appreciate um, all of you linking the kind of intersectional ways in which the class is very central, right? The kind of military industrial complex is a real, um, is very central, I think, to the ways in which we talk about nation states and the neoliberal economies that um, profit at the expense of black and brown poor communities transnationally. So at this moment, actually, I don't want to take up too much more time, although I could be going on for hours here. So we have several questions that are in the chat box that I wanted to, to call our attention to. Um, so uh, a question comes from Evan um, Jabaz. Um, why is it so hard for both countries to make peace? If, oh, I don't know who would like to, to take that. Um, I'm just quick, I'm just quickly, um, with sincerely and with respect, I'm going to answer the question with two questions. Why are most people, why is it so difficult for the world to end poverty? Why are so many, why are most people still hungry? One, the first question. Second question, why was it so hard or difficult to end slavery? I think these two questions will help to answer mm -hmm. um, that, that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Natalia. Anyone else would like to, to address that question? I, I would briefly, but I'd rather hear from Keith because he's been so modest with his time. <laughs> uh, and so if you'd like to respond, I think. I think, um, uh, first, I really appreciate Natalia's reframing um, of the question. Um, and I also just kind of want to um, start that we're not talking about two equal countries, right? Um, in contrast to, to many other kinds of political conflicts and military conflicts that, that we can see um, underway in the world where um, we're talking about um, one state that has been recognized as such by, um, by the international community and um, funded to a, a large degree um, by the world superpowers um, and another people who are living under occupation and have continued to live under occupation since um, 1948 and 1949. 
a people that um, is also, as, as, I, as I tried to gesture towards, a peoplehood that um, has been absolutely fragmented and dispersed yeah. across the globe. Right. So when we're thinking about solidarity with Palestine and, and, and Palestinians, part of what we're talking about um, has geographical contours in this historic land called Palestine. And part of what we're talking about are Palestinians living with us as friends and neighbors and colleagues and comrades. Um, and so um, so I, in, in thinking about kind of ending hostilities um, in, a, in an enduring way. I think we've, we've got to talk, just kind of talk in, in different kinds of vocabularies. Can I just- Yes, of course, please. I just want to add that um, we, you know, the example of a level playing field is used in this country all the time about giving everybody's on a level playing field there should be. And unless we want to begin with that sports analogy and acknowledge that there is no level playing ground, uh, you can't have a dialogue because the power differential is enormous. And um, it just, you know, <laughs> it's the lonely worker going up against the uh, power of a Bezos and saying, I think we should talk about the way you distribute wages. It doesn't work very well. Bezos can just fly to the moon and tell you that you helped pay for it. It's the same in inequity, disequilibrium. I would say, Elizabeth, to kind of add to kind of like, yes, it's difficult, but I really appreciate the centering of power, but it does, you know, power of the people. And I think that that's to Natalia's yes. point earlier, right? Uh, talking about the South African context um, and the global, global efforts made to kind of, one, be able to name this power and also collectively move towards um, resolutions that are in the benefit of other, um, um, in, in the case of South Africa community. Um, and so I do think that that is something to kind of consider um, how we can be agents of social transformation as well. So there's a qu another question that comes in from uh, the Q&A. What is your response on the U.S. passing a $1 billion funding of the Iron Dome today? Is there anyone who would like to take this question? <laughs> I'd just say it's obscene and, and I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, yes, Natalia. It, it, why did Donald Trump want to build a, a wall to to stop Mexican people to come into the U.S.? I know I'm being I'm being um, silly, but the the reality really is this is how capitalism works. It has got profits. There are people working to this, this, the business of this wall, just like there, are, there is the business of, of arms. If you think of these things as business, that somebody is profiting, somebody is buying the material to, to build um, the, this, this wall, there are, there are ingredients to make this wall and, and there, there's people sitting around the table and saying, okay, I'm selling steel. So who's going to buy a, a million dollars worth of steel from me? And then I will in, in turn buy something else. So it is that kind of, 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 of exchange beyond it being, oh, we just defending this one or we're protecting this one. The same as the business of guns, really. It is, it is you know, it doesn't think of human life um, or, or protecting human life. It, it, there is the business, the money-making element of it that is at the top of the decision-makers' minds. Thank you so much, Natalia. And I just want to be mindful, we just have a few more minutes. So I want to get through a couple more of these questions if at all possible. Um, we have a question from Nadia um, asking how folks can connect with you all. So um, if possible, um, 
um, if the at any given moment the panelists could go ahead and provide their contact information in the chat box, and then perhaps that could be a way for folks to connect with you all. Um, and then uh, we have a question actually that came in the chat um, from uh, Nadia, I believe. As a Palestinian American, I would like to say thank you that she's thanking all the panelists. Um, um, but also, there needs to be more engagement now in universities on, on the conversation around Palestine and Palestinians' history, our fight for liberation, ultimately how we are all connected. So how can universities carve spaces, perhaps, for these types of conversations, given we are here at a, um, at a university and acknowledging, Elizabeth, the work of uh, CSUN and Dominguez um, Pills, how can we get um, have more of these conversations with the universities? Dr. Feldman is at Berkeley. Um, your thoughts on that? Sure. Well, I mean, part of um, part of what I was trying to to say in my remarks is that simply the the, the practice of study, a thoroughgoing practice of study, needs to be there. Needs to be space for that on university campuses including US university campuses. Hard, critical, um, complicated practices of study. You know, we, we do this all the time when it comes to a variety of social issues, when it comes to uh, the hard sciences, the natural sciences, right? Um, holding space to grapple with challenging histories, um, is part of what, uh, part of the promise of university. And to the degree that we can do that um, effectively and in ways that support our students, support um, fellow faculty, support community to get involved, I think that's, that's absolutely crucial. And we have, mm -hmm. we have models for that, right? I, you know, I'm cognizant of the ways in which um, ethnic studies in particular as a kind of space on university campuses to grapple with um, complicated histories, histories of racism, histories of colonialism, histories of racial capitalism, and the centering of the voices of those who are um, particularly um, disproportionately affected by these kinds of power relations. We have carved out these spaces. And so, you know, one, hope I have as um, universities like the CSUs take up uh, an ethnic studies requirement is that we think hard about what, um, not only what solidarity movements looked like in the origin stories of, of ethnic studies in California, mm -hmm. but what those solidarity movements look like today and what are the sort of the practices and, and theoretical um, frameworks that we can we can bring to bear there, and I think in that context we have um, really strong ground to stand on um, to center Palestinian and, and Palestinian American histories and experiences. Thank you so much for that, um, uh, Keith. It, would anyone else like to add to that? And I definitely feel like, especially here at the CSU system, with the ethnic studies and actually the mass mobilization of students to center that has been extremely viable for um, centering students who otherwise would feel silenced in this process of settler colonial kind of erasure, right? It yeah. is centering um, our histories at the university level. Um, okay, so I know that we have just a couple more minutes before we have to wrap up, but so we might just be able to take one more question and I do encourage everyone to reach out to our panelists. Elizabeth, please. I just want to say that right now, the state of California is formulating its ethnic studies policies for the, uh, I think, secondary school level. And so far, they have erased Arabs from uh, being part of that because of the inclusion of Palestinian in the language. They wanted Palestine removed from the language. So you can engage with that, um, uh, I think. And it's a struggle that's ongoing right now. You know what, actually, Elizabeth, that's a perfect way. Unfortunately, we're not going to have too much more time to go through questions. I would like to ask everyone, to, um, uh, Keith, Natalia, Elizabeth, if you have any final thoughts um, for our guests. Um, and again, thank you once again for being here. I would like to um, thank you all for this opportunity to be here. 
And may we continue to ask the questions, mm -hmm. but also may we continue to inform ourselves. Um, find other examples that are not just Palestine, because when we find other examples, mm -hmm. it, it becomes easier, not the word, but I'll use it as a placeholder, to understand or to get to grips with questions like, why can't they just make peace? Um, is, is, is Israel not just um, um, protecting itself or defending itself against uh, terrorists or, you know, to, and to think of also the, the naming and the languaging of terrorists. I mean, people like Nelson Mandela, until very recently, actually, like Nelson Mandela was still on the US terrorist list. Mm -hmm. So to just think of how, who, who do we get to call uh, terrorists sometimes uh, maybe misleading. There's a lot, but I'm gonna keep quiet and say thank you uh, for, for engaging with us. Thank you. Elizabeth Keith. I just wanna say thank you. Um, I have appreciate you doing this. And I know that this is part of the new DEI or DIE, whatever it is, initiatives that are across and around the state. And I also want to say that we need to understand that uh, when the university became concerned about civil behavior on campus, it was also a concern with not engaging around the issue of Palestine. Thank you all. Final, final words. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, just wanted to, to end by saying thank you um, to open up this space um, to, um, to have this conversation in the context, as, as Elizabeth is noting, of conversations around inclusion and belonging on university campuses, I think is um, a really important, uh, it marks a really important practice. And I just want to acknowledge that and um, thank the organizers and, and uh, yeah. thank everyone who came. Thank you so much. At this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Freddy Sanchez. Thank you, Rana, and thank you all for, for staying with us and engaging in conversation. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Natalia, Elizabeth, and, and Dr. Fieldman for serving as not only our panelists, but, but truly engaging in our conversation um, of such complex reality that we're currently living on. As we continue to navigate to understand historical context and understand how to navigate, to continue to build solidarity and community, we must look deeper to the narrative and how globally we are interconnected. Rana, thank you so much for facilitating today's conversation mm -hmm. and drawing the parallels, um, not only for, for what was discussed today, but really to think about social justice on a more complex issues of things that are happening today. We also wanna thank Dominguez Hill, especially the local student union, for their collaboration with this program, especially Melissa, Israel, and Anthony, who have been part of the planning team and our student assistants, Sam and Duane, who we couldn't have done without your assistance. Yeah. And lastly, thank you, Ayan, for coordinating and for allowing us to continue to think critically on how we best support our students in our communities. Thank you all for coming.